Good evening and once again, welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, November the 28th, 2021. This is the second lesson of the day, the lesson that will be presented when we gather together at 6 p.m. And again, and as always, if you are in the Bellflower or the Los Angeles area, uh, we invite you to come and meet with us as we gather to worship God. Uh, each Sunday at 10.50 in the morning and at 6 p.m. in the evening. And, of course, we also have online Bible studies uh, in place. And uh, 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 in the meantime, I want to welcome you to this particular lesson once again as we share with it with you, with it, with you online. And, and hopefully, and I know I say this continually, uh, that you are not letting this be a substitute for gathering together with God's people wherever you are. That is not my intent. My intent with these lessons is simply to teach, to share the Word of God. And so let's go ahead and get started with our lesson for the evening. We are continuing our study of the, the doctrine of premillennialism. And over the course of our studies, we have, uh, we have begun over the past few weeks to examine various aspects of this doctrine. We've, we've talked about the rapture. And the last uh, uh, two or three lessons, we've actually dealt with the seven-year tribulation following the rapture. And associated with that third lesson about the, the, the tribulation or the great tribulation, last week we began to examine the book of Revelation and talked a little bit about apocalyptic literature, and we talked about the nature of the book of Revelation, and I'm going to deal with that, uh, remind us again of what we mentioned, because that ties into what we're going to talk about tonight in our lesson, because we want to continue with some more specifics associated with this theory of premillennialism. Namely, we want to talk about the Antichrist. And we want to talk about the Battle of Armageddon. Both of those recorded in the book of Revelation or ad supposedly addressed in the book of Revelation. And so that's what we are going to deal with in this particular lesson. So let's go ahead and get started with our study here this evening. Now, of course, we've shown this chart because this is uh, one of many charts that's available online that, that tries to outline the theory of premillennialism in various ways. And basically, we are currently in the church age, that is the uh, that small line to the right of the cross, which represents the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is supposedly going to last until the trib uh, till the uh, the rapture of God's righteous saints actually takes place and then following that there will be the seven years of tribulation three and a half years in which uh, the world will basically be in chaos and there will be natural disasters there will be wars there will be famine and various other things that will take place and yet men will still not repent Nations will begin to unite together, including a, a united Europe, as some premillennialists teach. And then about halfway through, the Great Tribulation will begin, which is a persecution of Jews who have converted to Christ during this time, of which they will say that there's 144,000 that will be converted. And then there's a great multitude of Gentiles who will also surrender to God. But the Antichrist will arise, and he will begin... To, who, who incidentally is a leader, he will begin to persecute these believers. And that will last about three and a half years until the Lord returns, which premillennialism calls the second coming of Christ. And that would be uh, on uh, this line over here that we're dealing with in our particular chart. And of course, after he comes, there will be this great war, which is entitled the Battle of Armageddon. And... Satan will be defeated, and then Jesus will reign on earth for a thousand years with his saints literally in Jerusalem. And it'll be a time of, of, of great peace and prosperity in the world, and everything will be the way that God intended for it to be. And of course, at the end of the thousand years, for a very brief period of time, Satan will be loosed, but he will be put down again, and then eternity will begin. Now, when you give consideration to this, the book of Revelation is actually where they get much of their timeline, even though they go all over the Bible to, to find uh, what exactly is supposed to take place. And it is because of that that I want to remind us 
about the book of Revelation, something that we talked about last week. And I just want to mention these things because this is important to, to grasp this as you deal with the various aspects of Revelation. We talked about last week apocalyptic literature. And basically that's a type of literature with a hidden message portrayed in symbolic language. It was, it was a actually literature that was prevalent among the Jews during the first century AD as well as the the first the, the last two centuries BC so for about 300 years as as the Jews were facing tribulations and persecutions oppression by various peoples these these symbolic letters would be written with the intent of encouraging them that that God is in control and God is going to overcome and that was the primary message of these particular uh, letters. They were designed to encourage Jewish communities during these times of persecutions and troubles. The book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book which Jews would have been familiar with in, in, in many ways. They would have understood what was being revealed in this type of literature, but yet it would be something hidden from authorities should they intercept a copy of this letter as it was being circulated. So those are things to keep in mind. Now we also talked about with this that there are several rules to remember when you talk about the book of Revelation. And uh, again, last week we went into detail about these. I'm just going to mention them here. First of all, the book's primarily some, uh, symbolic. The very first word is apocalypse, uh, apocalypso, which, it, which means this symbolic message. And it's all, we're also told in verse 1 that it was symbolized. Furthermore, as we approach the book of Revelation, we need to make it relevant to the audience to whom it was originally written, which would have been the seven churches of Asia, as you find in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and actually mentioned in chapter 1 and in verse 11. Also helpful in dealing with this type of literature is the historical background. First of all, the historical background of when it was actually written. And, and, and if Revelation was written around 95 AD, the Christians were facing uh, severe persecutions at the hand of Domitian. And as the Roman Empire continues for another uh, um, 300 years or so, they're going to experience several other persecutions by Roman Caesars. And so that historical background is the backdrop for what is being written. And you also have the historical background of various symbols that are used, which means you go to the Old Testament and you learn from them. And furthermore, while, while uh, those in the world would just see this as some type of a, uh, of a fictitious book or a fictitious uh, story, the audience to whom it was written, they would have the key. They would have the way to understand what was being addressed. And if this is the case, then the majority of the book has already been fulfilled. And I know there's some debate as to exactly how much, but the majority of the book would have already been fulfilled. And the things we're going to talk about, they would have likely been fulfilled already. And keep in mind, and this is the important thing about apocalyptic literature, keep in mind the overall message of the book and various visions as you determine what is the message behind the various visions. And sometimes don't get caught up in the small details. And ultimately remember, and this is a summary of the book of Revelation, keep this in mind with every page you read. God wins. Or, or you might say, Jesus wins. And that's going to be a repetitive observation as I go through this lesson and the rest of our study dealing with, uh, dealing with premillennialism. So together these views show you that the theory of premillennialism is, is actually fantasy. It's fantasy where, where individuals have fantasized about what each event means and they've tried to plug in and it's almost always associated with the time frame we're living in now. And my, and my encouragement and admonition to everyone when we consider that is don't get caught up in that type of fantasy. Just realize the overall message of the book. But 
we still need to be aware of the various things that are being taught so that we can address them. And that is why tonight I want to talk about two of the aspects of premillennialism. The first is the rise of the Antichrist, and the second will be the Battle of Armageddon. I'm going to mention a, a couple of other things as we go through this as well that we don't have time to, in our studies to cover in great detail. Now, when we talk about the rise of the Antichrist, the premillennial view basically goes something like this. We're dealing with the tribulation as it takes place, and you've got this uh, three and a half years of, of great disasters and wars, and maybe even nuclear wars take place. And as a result of that, basically the world um, uh, gathers together into groups of nations. And one of those nations is a is a conglomeration of uh, is a conglomeration of nations in Europe, and they become a united Europe, if you will. And and uh, uh, according to some, the leader of this European Union or one of these groups, he actually becomes the leader who will become the Antichrist. Now it is said that according to uh, according to some premillennialists that he makes a compact with Israel and they start to rebuild the temple because according to premillennialism, the temple has to be rebuilt so that they can offer the sacrifices that God has demanded and such. And Jesus can reign as priest and king at that time. So he makes a compact with, with Israel and they're able to build a temple. But in time, after actually about three and a half years, he breaks his covenant with them. And, be, and the Christian faith will become outlawed because this man, uh, this man of perdition, this, uh, this antichrist, he will uh, uh, act as if he is a god and he will demand that people worship him. And, and those who refuse to worship him will be rejected. And we find that those who do worship, that they will receive a mark. When you hear about the mark of the beast, that's where this comes from. But Christians, they refuse to wear that mark and to bow down to this ruler. And as a result of that, the Christian faith is outlawed. And he, he, uh, he uh, uh, engages in a persecution of Christians that's unlike anything in all of history. And remember, we talked about that great tribulation in Matthew 24 a few weeks ago, and it was unlike anything before it in the world. So this is supposed to be the greatest of all persecutions. Christians, because they don't have this mark, they will not be able to engage in commerce. They'll lose their job. They'll lose their homes. They won't be able to work. Uh, they'll face persecutions and rejection in so many different ways. That's the premillennial view of the Antichrist. Now, as to passages that are associated with this, we have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 13, which talks about a man of sin that had to come before the end of the world. And I'm going to talk more about some of these uh, in just a minute. Here, I just want to mention them. A second passage, and this is in Revelation, is Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10, where you see this beast rising out of the sea that has seven heads and ten horns, and he has a blasphemous name, and basically he makes war with the saints, and he tries to overcome them. And he gives authority to an, another beast, a false prophet, if you will, who's also mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. We find in Revelation 17 and in verse number 10, he's mentioned again, and there is a harlot who's described as Babylon, who is riding on top of the beast. This is supposedly the Antichrist. And you may recall a couple of weeks ago when we dealt with Matthew 24, and in verse 24, Jesus warned that there would be false Christs and false prophets. And, and so the, the, they, they used that to say that Matthew 24 a, a, at least includes the end times, which is, not necessary, which is not the case based on the context. And then there are some passages in 1 John 2, uh, verse John 4, 2 John 7, which mention by name the Antichrist. And incidentally, these are the only times in the New Testament where the word Antichrist is actually used. 
And, and there's some interesting observations about that text. So these are some of the passages that are used. Now I want to take a few moments and I want to look at some of these passages and, and just kind of read through them. And, and I want you to make some observations about that. And let's begin with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and while you're turning over to that text, understand that Paul is dealing with some misconceptions concerning the Lord's return. You may remember in chapter 1, which premillennialists say is talking about the rapture, you know, Paul talks about how, how those who are dead, they're going, to, they're going to be raised from the dead, and they're going to meet with the Lord in the air, and those who are alive and remain when he comes, they will be with him and meet with the Lord in the air. And of course, we just talked about that's the end of time. But there were misconceptions, and as a result of that, there were, uh, there were some in Thessalonica who had quit working, and they were thinking that the end was so near that, uh, 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 that they didn't need to do anything, that they could uh, just do whatever they wanted because they didn't have to worry about their future. And one of the reasons Paul writes 2 Thessalonians is to deal with that and to tell them, no, you get to work. This is where Paul says, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat, is the challenge that Paul issues to these brethren uh, and, and other things concerning that in chapter 3 and in verse number 10. But now in chapter 2, he says there are things that have to happen before the Lord returns. He says in verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 2, let no one deceive you by, many, by any means. For the, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will give them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you find here in these verses that Paul says that before the Lord returns, first of all, a falling away has to come, and then you're going to have this man of sin who is revealed. And I want you to notice some observations about what's in this text. Number one. In verse number 3, he is described, first of all, as the man of sin, and secondly, as the son of perdition. And incidentally, something that I think is interesting about that expression, the son of perdition, we actually made reference to that in our morning lesson. Over there in John chapter 17, where Jesus is praying to the Father concerning his disciples, and he makes the point there that... that uh, uh, those whom you gave me I have kept in verse 12, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot is described as the son of perdition. Here in 2 Thessalonians, one of the ways that this man of sin is described is as the son of perdition. Now, I don't believe 2 Thessalonians is talking about Judas Iscariot. He's already gone. He hanged himself. He has been replaced. But I do believe it's somebody of his character. Somebody who would betray the Lord, if you will. He's described further on in our text in, uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and in about verse number 11 or, or, uh, um, he, or, he's, or in verse number 9, he's described there as the lawless one. So you have three descriptions. And Paul says before he, uh, that so there's going to be a falling away first. This is somebody who's going to oppose uh, he's going to oppose God, and he's going to exalt himself as God. Uh, he's going to sit at the seat of God, which is an expression that could simply mean that he's making his own rules. 
and things associated with that. He's someone who's going to demonstrate great power and he's going to deceive many people with the powers that he demonstrates. But they're called, if you'll notice in, in the latter part of our text, it says that their strong delusions uh, will come along. And he makes the point there in verse number nine. It is with the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. What he's able to do is not real. It's supposedly the same as a miracle, but it's not a miracle. And he doesn't really have power, but he has the ability to deceive the peoples with his supposed powers. That's what you have in this particular leader. Now, here's some observations that I want to make about this text. Number one, as you read the text, there is nothing to indicate that he's a world leader. This is, uh, uh, he's described as somebody who's religious. He's a religious deceiver. Furthermore, when the Lord returns, he's going to immediately consume him with, uh, uh, with the breath of his mouth. Uh, he's go, who, this individual or individuals will be destroyed. And, I, and I, I see this. There's nothing to indicate that this has to be one person and one person only. Paul could be saying that there are going to be many people who are going to come up who are going to act like this throughout history, however long history lasts. But a falling away has to happen first. And I can tell you right now that you can look at church history and you can see a falling away. And it could be a specific person or it could be a false office. And, and, and an example of that, and I don't have time to develop this now, the, the papacy, which over the course of about 500 years developed from the biblical pattern of local leaders to a universal ruler on earth who early on he claimed to be he claimed to be sitting with the authority of Christ and so and and he was he was virtually worshiped and so on this could be about the papacy and i would say if it is it's not just the papacy but it would be similar types of offices with men who make claims and take upon themselves that type of authority. And there have been many throughout history who have been treated like that. So you have this particular individual in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an antichrist coming at the end of the world. That's the point I want you to see in that. Look at the text. Revelation 13. This is another interesting passage here, and, and, uh, and this is a passage where, as we look at Revelation 13, I want you to remember the principles that we talked about early on. You know, keep in mind that this is symbolic language. Keep in mind the overall message of good wins over evil. I think that's the point that we need to get out of all of this. And you'll see an example of that as you read Revelation 13 about this beast that is rising out of the sea. Then I, uh, Revelation 13 and verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now that beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword 
must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the and the faith of the saints. So, you know, as you read about that, you read about this this great and terrible beast that comes up and has seven heads and uh, uh, or or, or uh, uh, yeah, seven heads and or uh, let's see how was it described there? It says it says there that he had seven heads and ten horns and a crown on the on on the ten horns and he, and he and he was all different types of animals and shapes and so on and he blasphemes against God. You know, if you look at this from a overall principle standpoint, this is just describing somebody that uh, that stands up and resists God. Does it have to be a specific individual at the end of time? Or could it be representative of a type of person? So you have the idea of it being symbolic with the overall principles. You have evil and you have evil that is defeated. And that's the thing to give consideration to when you look at Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Just remember that as your background. You have, you have somebody that rises that persecutes Christians. And that can apply to many people throughout history. Or it could also apply to some in the audience in particular. And I'll get back to that in, in just a moment here. We also have Matthew 24, which I'm just going to mention here. Uh, because we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, false Christs. Well, Jesus warned that that was going to happen. And it happened before the destruction of Jerusalem. But that brings us to 1 John. And this is what's interesting. Some people who talk about the Antichrist and the rise of the Antichrist don't even go to 1 John as they deal with who this Antichrist is. And that's interesting because... Because when you read what John says about Antichrist and the Antichrist, it defeats the idea of this one man speaking blasphemous words. Let's read from 1 John here for a few moments. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2 and in verse number 18. And incidentally, the word Antichrist is only found five times in the New Testament. All five of them are found in the book of 1 John. The first one we read of is in, is in uh, 1 John 2 and in verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. I want you to notice he's telling them, it is the last hour now. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Many Antichrists. And John is saying, even at the time that I speak, there are many Antichrists. Now, who are these antichrists? Well, you read it, chapter 2, and in verse 22. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Chapter 4, and in verse number 3. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Second John 7. Second John 7, John there says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So what is an antichrist according to John? An antichrist is somebody who denies who Jesus is who denies that Jesus came in the flesh to this earth. That's who John deals with. And, and he says, an antichrist is someone that rejects God. Someone who rejects his message. Someone who rises to a power of prominence and he leads people away from Christ. Simply stated, that's who antichrist is. And remember, this is the only books that use that particular term. So let's give consideration to this. You know, when you look at these texts, who exactly is the Antichrist? You know, well, the, the, you know, the first question I would ask is, are the enemies of 2 Thessalonians, 1 John, and Revelation even the same people? I, I don't know that I can answer that because I, I, what I see in them is they all describe a type of person. 
somebody who rejects God, somebody who speaks blasphemy against God. And all three of those passages are consistent in dealing with that. And it could be anybody who verbally rejects Jesus. It does not have to be one specific individual. It could be, and in, in the book of Revelation, if it is, you know, as it is written to that original audience, uh, John could have had somebody in particular in mind. You know, the man of sin, the man of sin that you read about in 2 Thessalonians could, could be a specific person. Or as we pointed out, it could be an office that, uh, that is against Christ. Again, it could describe more than one specific person. It could be anybody who rejects Christ. And I think you can tie that to many of these. It could be a Roman emperor or someone later in time, or maybe many or all of all of those through time. And, and, you know, if you look at the book of Revelation, if it's dealing with those saints, more than likely, Revelation is addressing an emperor that, that accepted and wanted worship, which some of them did. You know, it's, it's called, I believe, the emperor cult is what it was called, or, or, uh, or the, 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 the Caesar cult kind of a thing because people would uh, he, he demanded worship that they burn a pinch of salt in his name and Christians were persecuted if they would not do that that could be who John has in mind in the book of Revelation and I kind of lean toward that as as the actual possible as the actual probability in the first place you, you know and uh, that's what I see in those particular texts and the whole point is all of these, what they're dealing with is false teachers and the false doctrines that they are teaching and the, the false power that they are bringing upon themselves trying to cause people to follow after them instead of ap after God. And that could be true of, of, of some specific individual back then. It could have been a Roman emperor or Roman empire emperors who were going to rise. Or, or some of these passages or all of them could be talking about false Christs and false prophets of all time who are going to eventually stand before God and answer and be dealt with by God. So when we talk about the Antichrist, that's the thing for us to keep in mind there. But now, after we deal with the Antichrist, and I know that that's a very um, a simple explanation, a whole lot more can be said, but, but I, I want to move on and deal with some other things. And I hope you get the main point of this, that it does not necessarily have to be some, uh, and it's not some person in the future, a specific person that God wanted to name by name, as, as far as that goes, uh, at least somebody in the future. But going beyond that, the next thing that we give consideration to is, is, is at the end of the tribulation, according to premillennialism, the Lord is going to return with his saints. And, and the foundation of this is found over in Revelation chapter 19. And what you find in Revelation chapter 19 there, and beginning in about verse number 11, John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes wars. And it goes on and describes him coming down, and basically he's preparing to engage in war against the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, the dragon, and uh, uh, their forces. There's supposed to be this battle, great battle that takes place. But I want you to understand that, uh, that in Revelation 19, this is the second coming of Christ according to premillennialism. I don't think this fits the rest of the Bible as it teaches about the second coming of Christ, which in a concluding lesson of this series, which we'll deal with next year, I'm going to address what the second coming really is. Or, or, or remind ourselves about the second coming. But here, this is how they tie it in line, and they say that the, when he comes back, it's not going to be the end. I don't believe that's the case. But that brings me to another doctrine associated with premillennialism that we need to keep in mind, and that is the Battle of Armageddon. And, and you know, as much as you hear the Battle of Armageddon discussed in the in, in the world today among, amongst religious leaders, especially premillennialists, you would think it was something that was 
that, that was found all throughout Scripture. But you know, it's kind of interesting that the word Armageddon is only found one time in the Bible. And that's in Revelation chapter 16 and in verse number 16. And in context here, you have seven bowls of wrath being poured out on the earth. And these are judgments from God. And in the first five bowls, you find various types of plagues that are taking place. Judgment, there's loathsome sores, and uh, the, the sea is turned to blood, waters are turned to blood, and, 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 and all the living creatures die in the sea and so on. You have scorched earth. Uh, 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 you have darkness and pain in the fifth one. And that brings you to the sixth bowl of wrath in which Euphrates is described as drying up. And the reason it is dried up is so that the, a way could be prepared for kings from the east to come and basically engage in battle. And in verse number 13, John there says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. I want you to notice the symbolism there. For they are spirits of the demons, performing signs which go out of the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to, to the battle of that, uh, of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So here you have this army described, un three, three unclean spirits that were like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon who is actually identified in the book as Satan. And then you have this beast that we talked about that's supposedly the Antichrist and the false prophet, someone who works with the beast. Uh, also recorded in Revelation 13. But what's interesting about Revelation 16, you have this bowl of wrath and Armageddon is met, mentioned here and the forces are gathered here. This is not the battle of Armageddon. This is just preparation for what is supposedly going to ta take place. The actual battle of, of Armageddon is recorded in Revelation 19, verses 19 through 21. And I want to read that in a few minutes. And basically you find that enemies gather together to make war against Christ who has come on his white horse that we read a few moments ago in chapter 19 and in verse 11 and following. And you find that the beast and false prophet are captured and cast into the lake of fire and the rest are killed with a sword. Birds are filled with their flesh. And that's what you have there in verses 19 through 21. Of, of, of Revelation chapter 19. That is what premillennialism describes as the battle of Armageddon. Now there's some things I want, to rem uh, I want us to think about it, uh, in this particular lesson. Number one, recall the importance of history in order to interpret what is in Revelation. And that has to deal with both the rel relevant audience, in this case the seven churches of Asia, persecuted Christians, as well as background. In other words, it had to be something that was significant to them. This victory of, of Christ over these evil forces has to have some relevance to them in the persecutions that they are going through. And furthermore, if uh, remember how I've said that they would have had the key and, and possibly a part of the key has to do with the Old Testament. Let me tell you a little bit about where Armageddon is. It is literally described as the, uh, it literally means the Valley of Megiddo. And many of the commentators say that the Armageddon is actually not even a real place. Even though there is reference in the Old Testament to a valley in northern Israel. And it's a valley that is called Megiddo. And or the Valley of Jezreel. It's a place that's located near Mount Gilboa. And all of this is in northern Israel when the 12 tribes were divided up. So it was in the northern portion of Israel. And there's some things to understand about that particular land in biblical Old Testament history. Now as to the actual land itself, what's interesting about this valley is 
many key valley or many key battles were actually fought over this land. It was a very strategic piece of land because if you look at a map and you look at the nation of Israel, you'll notice that where Israel is located from the standpoint of of uh, of land armies, it's basically at the center or, or at, at at the meeting point of three continents: Europe, Asia, and Africa. And so it was a piece. Of, the Israel was actually a piece of property that was so valuable because of where it was located in the world of that time, and various rulers fought over that land and it was a constant source of, of battles because of its strategic importance and you even find that in history going beyond the time of the Bible. Well here's an interesting thing about this valley though. It's a valley that's only about 20 miles uh, you know 20 miles I think 20 miles wide and 14 miles long or, or, or the opposite of that but the point is, is the battle that premillennialists teach, you know, there's supposed to be this great battle here. Revelation 9 and verse 16 talks about 200 million soldiers. Supposedly they, and they're actually horsemen. Uh, you find that they will meet at this place. In defeat in Revelation 14 and verse 20, you read, you read about this, this uh, uh, a river of, 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 of flowing blood for about 280 or for about 200 miles like 186 miles or something like that I think and blood is so high because of this battle that it reaches up to the horse's bridles but you can imagine how much blood that is but I also want you to you to imagine 200 million horsemen cramming together in an area 20 by 14 I don't think it's big enough it's not big enough to house that many supposed soldiers. So there's problem with it from a size standpoint. But also something else to consider about this valley is it was a famous battlefield. As I've already pointed out, it's strategic importance. But I want you to note in the Bible, there are numerous battles that are fought in that area. In Judges 5 and verse 19, this is where Deborah and Barak gained victory over the Canaanites who had been oppressing Israel. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 33, this is where Gideon defeats the Midianites. And remember, this was a, a, a battle where, where uh, uh, he whittled the army down to 300 valiant soldiers and gave them pictures, uh, uh, you know, clay pictures and and uh, candles underneath and horns and with that they defeated the Midianite army and Israel was delivered. It is in this area, Mount Gilboa I believe it is, where Saul fell to the Philistines. Wicked King Saul was de defeated in this place. Later on uh, another wicked king of Judah named Ahaziah he dies in battle at the hand of Jehu. And one of the things to understand about that is, is Ahaziah was a contemporary of, of, of the descendants of Ahab, the wicked king. And Jehu defeats Jezebel and that particular dynasty. And Ahaziah, who was supporting Ahab and, and, and Israel, he was wicked and he was defeated. You do also have here in 2 Kings 23 and verse 29 that Josiah is in battle and he dies against Pharaoh Necho. Now what's interesting here is Josiah was a very, very righteous king. But it was after Josiah dies that the nation of Judah begins to fall. Begins to be taken over by Babylon. So what is the point of all these different battles? Keep in mind the overall picture. This is a place where the forces of good and evil engaged in battle. And God's hand was often at work in this place. So what's the overall lesson that you get from the battle of Armageddon? You have the battles, the forces of good and evil fighting against each other. And in the end, God will win. Friends, that's the encouragement. Premillennialism wants to make Armageddon a literal place. 
And of course, they want to talk about the numbers as being literal. But you know, it's interesting how other aspects of, of these very same uh, visions, you know, these, these very same events that are recorded here, they'll say that they're figurative. You know, they'll talk about the soldiers uh, that look like frogs representing things, beasts and dragons. They represent men, nations, and individuals, and so on. And oftentimes, depending on who the premillennialist is, they will try to actually guess who it is. And of course, as I've always said, it's somebody today. You know, somebody in our time who it has to be. And here's my point. There's an inconsistency in the way they use these texts. They just pick and choose. The parts that are the parts that they want to be literal, they make literal, and the other parts they make figurative. My question is, why can it not all be figurative of, uh, of a, uh, the battle between good and evil? Why can't Armageddon be as symbolic as frogs coming out of the mouth of a dragon and of a beast and of a false prophet? You know, I want you to think about other places in the New Testament. Remember how Jesus would describe hell? You know, the word hell, as used by Jesus, is from the, the, the Greek word Gehenna. And the Greek word Gehenna was, uh, was a word that represented the Valley of Hinnom, which at the time of Jesus was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. And Jesus would use a place that they could relate to, and a place whose history was evil. A place where children were sacrificed by Israelite and Judah, Judah's kings to the god Molech. The valley was defiled by Josiah so that they could not do that anymore. And at the time of Jesus, it was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. And Jesus found the most deplorable place and said, that's where you're going to spend eternity. You're going to spend eternity in a place that terrible because you reject God. Zion and Jerusalem in the book of, uh, of Revelation are oftentimes used symbolically. In, in Revelation 14 and in verse number 8, it says here, Revelation or 14 and verse 1, I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with them 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. He, Jesus, uh, the lamb, Jesus, is standing on Mount Zion. Is that literal Jerusalem, or is it descriptive of uh, is it descriptive of God's spiritual city? I've talked about that in times past as we studied through the book of uh, Psalms or looked at the various Psalms and such. Or over in uh, twenty one and verse two, where John he sees this vision of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, representative of God's kingdom, spiritual. Revelation 14 and in verse number 8, where you find there the cry of an angel is, Babylon has fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You find this is descriptive of, of an ungodly nation that opposes God. Revelation 11 and in verse 8, you read there, their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Sodom and Egypt. When you think of Sodom, what do you think about? Where God is concerned, it is a city of gross immorality. When you think of Egypt, you think of the oppression of the children of Israel. <coughs> and that's what comes to the forefront of that particular passage there. Gross immorality and oppression. That's what you think of with the names Sodom and Egypt. Now here's my question. If all of these places, and most of them are mentioned in Revelation, Zion, Jerusalem, Babylon, Sodom, Egypt, if they can be spiritually representative of things, why can't Armageddon be spiritually representative of something? I think it can. Let me take that a step further. I think it is. I think that that's what we need to keep in mind. Remember, when you're studying the book of Revelation, I want you to remember the overall picture. The overall picture is what you have to think about here. What is the overall message? It's interesting. If you read Revelation 16 in detail, you'll find that it actually says nothing about the battle, as we've already pointed out. 
It actually occurs in Revelation chapter 19 is where you read about the battle. And interestingly, the actual battle, uh, you read there in Revelation 19. I haven't read this yet. Let's just read it real quick here. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 19. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse of, uh, and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeds from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Friends, that's the battle of Armageddon in the Bible. Everything that you hear about that great battle, that's it. Forces are gathered together. And what's interesting is it says that the beast is captured. And you'll notice <laughs> not a shot is fired. At least it's not written in the text there concerning that. But the rest are punished with the sword, which proceeds from the mouth of the king. Is that physical or is it talking about judgment? through his word. Friends, that's it. Think of the overall picture. And what is the lesson that we can learn from this when we step back? The lesson is this. No matter how great the forces of evil become, and you know, we always want to look at the world and see how bad it is right now, and it is. I, I believe it's worse now than it was uh, a few decades ago, but it could get even worse than this. But here's the point. No matter how great the forces of evil are, God is going to win. And just as you read there in verse number 20, the beast is captured and that's it. You know, at the snap of a finger, it'll be over with. It ain't this long drawn out battle that causes a, a, a river for 200 miles to be filled with blood. And on the battlefield, beasts, you know, with blood up to their bridles. It's spiritual. So what's the point of it? God's judgment against those who instigate persecution on his people. In the first century particularly. And if this is dealing with the first century in the book of Revelation and what they were going through, then this would be talking about God rendering his wrath against Rome. And I know there are some who take an early date to Revelation who believe it's talking about Jerusalem, but the same thing would apply. It's been fulfilled. God has punished those who are wicked. Or if you want to make it a broader description, it could be just it could be a description of his coming judgment. And when the Lord does return, Satan's going to be defeated. His servants are going to be judged. It's going to be over with. And eternity is going to begin. It's just that simple. When we think of it that way, we can take great comfort. Even as you read through the book of Revelation, you know, just as God could crush the enemies back then, whether it be Rome or Jerusalem, or if he had something else in mind that they would have understood, if God could crush them, he can crush our enemies as well. And he can do it in his time. When he's ready. How often are we told in scriptures that we are at war with Satan? Ephesians chapter 6. As well as other places. So what's the ultimate picture? God wins. Jesus wins. That's the comfort that we can take from reading the book of Revelation. And when you read about this great battle, or you read about the Antichrist, somebody that rises up and blasphemes and seeks to persecute Christians, never forget, God wins. And I'm going to tell you right now, He wins every time. And in the end, once and for all, it'll be over with. 
So as we wrap this lesson up, think about this. The, the biblical picture of judgment is terrifying. And certainly we may be facing terrifying times now, but imagine how terrifying it's going to be for his enemies. That's how great the wrath of God is. In Hebrews 10 and verse 31, we're told there it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, or it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Friends, I think we need to think about that continually. And here's the point. Instead of getting carried away with endless speculation about what is going to happen when the Lord returns, just make sure you're ready for his return. And that means if you have not yet obeyed the gospel, you need to become a child of God. Or if you have obeyed the gospel and you've wandered away from him, you need to come back. Make sure you are ready when the Lord returns because scriptures teach when he returns, that's it. And if you're not ready, you'll have eternity to regret that. But it is my hope and prayer that you will not. If you're not ready now, do what you need to to make yourself ready. And as it has been appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Think about that, and the lesson is yours. And if you would at this time, please bow with me. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, as we come to you, as always, we are thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace. We're thankful for everything that you have done for us. We are thankful that you sent Jesus to this earth to die for us. And dear God, we know that we live in a world that oftentimes and even to this day stands contrary to your will. And as we look out into the horizon, it seems that matters are getting worse and worse. And we don't know what the future holds. Maybe it will get worse before you return. But whatever happens in this world, help us as your family, as your children, to take comfort and to realize that no matter what happens, in the end, we will be victorious if we are faithful to you because you win. Jesus wins. Help us, dear God, to live with that hope. And with that hope, help us to be willing to do whatever it is that we need to do, to be willing to stand for the truth in all things and at all times. Dear God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus who gives us the victory. And amen. So again, I want to thank you for listening. And as always, I hope that there's something in this for you to give consideration to. If you have questions about some of the things that, that I have said, you know, uh, feel free to contact me and I'll do my best to get back with you concerning those particular elements there. Um, I do not profess to know it all. And this is an area that is very, very challenging. And these are uh, passages that, that, that I could uh, improve my understanding of what is being said. But I do not believe that I'm going to change my mind about the overall message of this book and the, the simplicity and encouragement that comes with that message. Now in the future, I'm actually going to take a break from studying premillennialism until next year. Uh, I'm going to be gone uh, some of December, and I've got a couple of other things to cover before then. So uh, un until then... Uh, 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 we will just continue to study some things, but when I come back, I'm going to deal with the thousand-year reign of Christ. I'm going to deal with the nation of Israel today. And then we're going to talk about whether or not we can have fellowship with those who teach premillennialism and why it is such a big deal. Then, of course, we will wrap up our study by talking about the second coming of our Lord. So uh, until that time, um, uh, go ahead and have a good day, and uh, Lord willing, uh, uh, we'll, we'll meet again in the future. Take care for now.